time. Amen. The gospel prospers during the good times and the bad, often more during the bad times. That's when we look around and realize how badly we need God in our life. The title this morning is the conclusion of Paul's first missionary journey. Profound, I know, but I grew up in church and I heard a lot about Paul and his missionary journeys, but then when I had any questions about it, I couldn't have told you. And so I hope that as a group of believers, we're growing and we're learning and we're getting some definite idea of what Paul was going through as the good news was spreading across the world. If you open your Bibles or turn them on to Acts in chapter 14, we're going to cover the whole chapter this morning, Lord willing. But some opening thoughts, I want to share this with you. We had a tough day yesterday, but it was a great day as well. We were able to have a memorial service to celebrate the life of Sister Teresa Stonecipher. And I want to tell you all something. I want to brag on you guys. What I saw was a group of believers gathering around one of their brothers who had lost his wife and what the world would say, would say it was way too early. People to serve, people here saying, how can I help? Musicians doing what they do. We had people out there preparing food, serving food, loving on his family. It was just an amazing thing to see. And I want to brag on y'all because that is just the tip of the iceberg of what y'all are doing as a group of believers at the church at the beach. It makes, not, not so much in a prideful way, I hope, but it makes my heart swell a little bit when I think about a group of people loving on their brothers and sisters in Christ, wanting what is best for them, and wanting to just camp around them to make sure that they can stand strong in their faith. And I thank y'all for being so good yesterday and so many days over the past at least a couple of years, and I'm for sure longer than that. But I've had a, a burden on my heart. When we were at the Southern Baptist Convention a couple of months ago, a man for Lifeway, Lifeway is an arm of the Southern Baptist Convention, and they produce the material that uh, some of our discipleship groups use, but also they do a lot with Dr. Tony Evans and uh, some, some other uh, more famous and some not so famous um, theologians and Bible scholars. But the head of Lifeway said this. Someone questioned him about the material that they produce. I thought it was very unfair. I thought it was not a very good setting for it, but, you know, free country, right? And someone questioned this man about that, and he said something that I knew, but it created a whole new urgency in my heart. He said, when people are looking at our material, we can tell by the first few minutes that they are on our website. And he said something that is so true. And he said, and when I go to a church, I only have to go one time, and I can tell you which direction this church is going. This church is either going in the direction of teaching, making disciples, and helping them grow, or the church is headed in the direction of reaching meaning evangelizing and bringing more people to faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. But rarely do we have any churches that are putting all the eggs in, both feet in, in order to do both, in order to reach people for Jesus Christ and for them to enter into, their, into his kingdom and also to teach them and help them mature and grow day by day in their faith. It created a burden in my heart on that June day. We already had it. We had been praying about a discipleship plan for our church for over a year as a staff, but it was like, wow, this is important. You see, I've asked you to pray, come, give, and go. And I've also had things, or our church has had things in place in order to get people into service for Christ's kingdom. But it's not enough just to show up and serve Jesus somehow and never grow in your knowledge and your love for him. You see, we can put a lot of emphasis on getting people into service, but if they're serving just to serve, or if they're serving just to make themselves feel good, or if they are serving just because Jay or some pastor told them to, well, what's the point of that? 
Jesus commanded us, and it's part of our church's mission statement, to make disciples. In order to make disciples, you have to evangelize. You have to go out, and you have to be a reaching church. And you know by now that that is my passion, is for us. My doctoral studies, it's about evangelism. It's about reaching the lost. It's about people going to heaven instead of hell. It's about them being able to live the best life they can because they're walking with Jesus. But at the same time, we can't have someone converted to Christianity and then just say, man, you got a ticket to get out of hell, have fun figuring this out, and then walk the other direction and try to reach and find someone else. And so as I was thinking about this, I realized that if I put a microphone in some of your faces and had a camera turned on, and I said, you know what, you, we're, we're supposed to be making disciples. What is a disciple? Boy, some of us would have a, have a tough time answering that question. And then if we took it even a step further and we said, okay, so, so maybe you have your, your get out of hell card, because you have put faith in Jesus. But what is a mature disciple? What, is, what does it look like? Who is this person that Jesus wants us walking with him and becoming? And so we came up with this, and I hope that we can put it in our hearts and put it in our minds, because just coming to church, just getting in a D group, just coming and serving God is not enough. Let's know why we're doing it, how we're doing it. Let's be intentional about serving Jesus, our great risen king. A mature disciple, someone who is continually growing in their walk with Christ. I don't know, folks, are you continually becoming more and more like Jesus? I have a lot of good days, but I have some bad days. And when I sit back and reflect on it, man, I didn't really do one thing to improve my walk with Jesus Christ today. Sometimes I even study for a sermon, but my walk with Christ has not improved. And that's sad, but a mature disciple is going to continually grow in their walk with Christ. A, a mature disciple has a hunger and thirst for the things of God. That is probably the toughest thing about our culture right now. It's to have a hunger and a thirst for what God says and what God desires and what God wants for us as opposed to what the culture and the world says we should desire and we should want. And that is so tough on you guys especially. I've identified this before. I work in a padded office almost. I mean, nobody comes in cussing up one side and down the other. Nobody comes in throwing tools because something is broken and won't work right. Everybody puts on their best face when they come to see the preacher. Thank you. <laughs> Please keep fooling me. But I know it's not true. Life is tough. But a mature disciple has a hunger and a thirst for the things of God, predominantly, mainly, his word. Do you love the word of God? Or do you think that it's probably wrong sometimes? A mature disciple loves the things and thirsts for the things of God and exhibits the fruit of the Spirit consistently. A mature disciple is not sinless, but one who sins less. And so with that, we need to talk about what is the fruit of the Spirit. Well, Galatians chapter 5, you, you don't have to turn there. But verses 22 through 26, Brother Barry loves this. He loves the fact that it's singular. It's a fruit. But we have nine aspects of this fruit. Fair enough, Brother Barry? He's passionate about that. The Apostle Paul to the churches of Galatia wrote this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Some people will try to tell you that they're a Christian, but they don't like and love other Christians. I'm calling their bull malarkey on that. Even though I love and like all y'all all the time, there might be a time that you don't like some other Christians, but Jesus has commanded us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit, being who God has designed you to be, includes loving others having joy in your heart and peace in your heart, no matter what the world says. Brother Ron was sitting right there where he always sits at 8 o'clock this morning ready for the 8.30 service. He lost his wife too early by any account that any of us could ever imagine, but doggone it, he has a joy and a peace because of the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working through him that would not be possible if it wasn't for Jesus, alive and well and ruling over his kingdom. Long-suffering. Thank goodness God is long-suffering. I need to work on that one. Kindness. As you all know, I coached, I coached basketball for 20 years. I wasn't very kind. 
I convinced myself that those boys only knew one type of language and I was going to use their language to make them do what I needed them to do to put a stupid leather ball through a stupid metal hoop. How mundane is that? But that's what I thought was the most important thing. And I wasn't always very kind in order to get the results that I wanted. Goodness, are you good to other people? Faithfulness. God is so faithful to us as his believers. Gentleness. That's something I'm doing a lot better with my grandkids than I was with my kids, right? The, uh, my son Gannon, he tells me regularly, he'll shake his head, throw his hands up. If I'd have done that, you'd have thrown me through a wall. Yeah. No, I'd have thrown you into the wall. I wouldn't ever have to pay for the back side of the wall having to be repaired too. That's kind of a joke. Self-control. Are you under control even when things don't go right? That is hard. Man, people will lie about you. They will make stuff up. Satan is always at work trying to divide. But are you under control? Whew. Let me handle this the way Jesus would handle it. And then the Bible says, against such there is no law. And so in our kind of description or definition of a mature disciple, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit, and so we need to make sure that we know what the fruit of the Spirit is because those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those who are Christians, we crucify the sin, we crucify the passions of the world. Those are crucified, they are put away, they are, they are, they are in the past, and we are now longing for the fruit of the Spirit, and we are continually walking with Christ so that those, that fruit becomes manifest in everything about us. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So we are trying, we are trying as a church to help you and help all of us, myself included, become mature disciples, to go out and reach the lost and then go out and teach the saved. And while we do it, this is important because here's the thing, the churches that are great at teaching, they look down on the churches that are great at reaching. Y'all probably don't live in the theological, doctrinal church world that I do. I get it. But I want to tell you this right now. The churches that are great at teaching, they'll say, we are the ones that teach the truth, and we're the ones doing it the way it should be. Yeah, but the problem is, if we just did things your way, nobody knew would ever be saved because you've never brought anyone through the power of God to faith in Jesus Christ. But then the ones that are the reaching churches... They're boring, they're lame, they're no fun. All they do is talk doctrine and theology. We're out here, and we're doing cartwheels, and we're painting rainbows, and we're having a big old time as we are reaching the lost. And they look down on the teaching church. Folks, we are commanded by Jesus Christ to be both reaching and teaching. And the discipleship plan is a way for us to make that happen because let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So, to wind up our opening thoughts for today, <laughs> pray, come, give, and go. Come and worship Sunday mornings, first Wednesday worship when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Get in the boat. Come get assimilated. Find out. Make sure that you are truly saved. Find out about your personality. Find out about the spiritual gift or gifts that God has given you. Find about your passions, your pains, and your personal profile so that you can get into service for the kingdom, but then join discipleship groups and complete the TCATV discipleship plan. So I want to talk just a little bit about that. It's going to be nine groups. You're going to be able to go through one, a 12-week period, just like our discipleship groups have always been. They go September, October, November. Then we're off in December for the holiday. Then we go January, February, March. We're off in April. Then we go May, June, and July. And then we're off in August. So it's about 12 weeks for each one. Here they are. Evangelism, how to study the Bible, apologetics, spiritual warfare, prayer, church history, biblical finances. That's not about getting you to necessarily give more money to the church. It is that there is a true way that God desires you for you to spend the money he has given you so that the burdens of debt and that the chains that money will put on you will be freed and you can give more than you ever thought possible if you handle your finances the way God has designed. Creation, some people would say the earth is millions of years old. Some people would say that it's six to 8,000 years old. What gives? 
Let's study it from a biblical perspective and the spiritual disciplines. Celebration, Dr. Richard Foster's book will be the text in that. We'll talk more about the literature next week. But it's on Sundays, 8.30 a.m. Or, or the D group, and the D groups will be offered at 10 a.m. So you'll come and worship and then you can go to a D group. If Sunday morning D groups uh, aren't good for you, then we're going to have them offered Wednesday at 6. Now, it might, you might not get to take the one you really wanted to first because maybe you can only come at 6 on Wednesday and only the three or four that are offered on Wednesday night. But I promise you, don't stress about this. Being a disciple is a big deal. Evangelism, boy, that can be daunting. But this is designed with every Christian in mind to help you go from where you are in your walk with Jesus to where God wants you to be. Because there is nothing like being in the will of God. And if I can help you get there, and if this church can help you get there, then doggone it, we got to step it up, we got to roll up our sleeves, and we got to make it happen. So, with that, a couple of doctrinal issues that we have today. One that we're going to see in, in the... Uh, um, in the lesson today is this, is that we're going to have general revelation versus special revelation. And that is this thought, that because of the earth, because God created everything and God sustains everything in the universe, holding it all together, that every person is without excuse and should believe in God. But believing in God is a long way from putting faith in Jesus Christ and being saved. In order to be saved, we have special revelation. We're going to see that back in bi biblical times, people were able to perform signs and miracles in order to make things happen that would point people to Jesus. Occasionally, that might still happen today. But for the most part today, we have God's Word to help us as special revelation to figure out how to be right with God. Another doctrinal issue that we have come up today is this idea of apostles. You've heard this well, many times here already, but I like whenever it comes up in the text to address it. Apostles of Jesus Christ. We had the 12 original apostles. Judas fell away. Matthias replaced him. And the apostle Paul became kind of the 13th apostle, if you will. But they were witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, and they were chosen by Jesus Christ himself. So in one aspect, we have the apostles. It was an office. They were chosen by Jesus for special work in the birthing of the church. But it is poss possible because apostelos, the, the, the Greek word, means to send. The noun, rather, the noun would be messengers, if you will. So what we see from Paul and Barnabas today, when it talks about them being apostles, they are messengers of the church in Antioch of Syria who put them onto their journey that we're talking about and have been talking about for the last couple of weeks. So Barnabas was not one of the apostles in the sense of Peter, John, James, Andrew, and the other eight, Matthias, the other seven, Thaddeus, I'll, I'll spare you my uh, attempt to get through all of those. But at the same time, he was an apostle that was a sent one by the church in Antioch. Where are we in the story? It's Luke's second volume. He wrote the Gospel of Luke, and now the activities of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. The Trinity is involved every week in every passage. We had the first three panels of part one. Now we're in part two, panel one, and we'll finish this up next week. On the next slide that you see will be a map. And I just want you to know, you can Google search Paul's first missionary journey. You'll see that this journey lasted about a year. You'll see that it was the shortest in distance and the shortest in time that Paul took out of his three missionary journeys, or all four of them, if you consider when he was arrested and going to Rome. But you can look at that for yourself when you get the opportunity. So first, in Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 7, this first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas has landed us in this city, Iconium. If you would, read aloud with me the first seven verses. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews, and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. But the believing Jews stirred up the, unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe in cities of Lyconia into the surrounding region, and they were preaching the gospel there. 
So here they are, they've, they've gotten to this city of Iconium, they have left the city in Antioch, and this city is ruled by a group of citizens. They have almost a democracy within the municipality. Uh, we hear um, from this book called The Acts of Paul and Thecla, we hear about a great description of Paul. You might have heard of some of this stuff before. And it, it addresses Paul as being a man who was short, he was bald, he was bow-legged, and he had a big old crooked nose. I kind of find that somewhat humorous because all of us have doubts that God can use us just the way we are. But as I look out at you, a group of beautiful people, I want you to know that I don't see any of you as short and bald and bow-legged and huge, big, crooked nose. Guess what? He used Paul and he can use you too. So get over yourself and get to service for Jesus. Many people believed. But the Jews, they embittered or they poisoned the Gentiles. Ladies and gentlemen, when you go out there and you're serving Jesus, make no mistake about it, people will poison the well. They'll talk badly about you. They'll lie about you. They'll try to tear you down behind your back, all of those things. But you just stand firm and you keep telling people about Jesus and you keep standing up for what's right because God is ultimately in control and he will take care of everything that he needs to take care of on your behalf. We see in this passage that God used miracles to point people to him. He still uses miracles. Every time that someone is saved, it is a miracle. Don't let anyone tell you that miracles don't happen because if miracles don't happen, then salvation never occurs. And I'm here to tell you that I get to witness people put faith in Jesus almost every week, if not every day. Miracles are still happening day after day on this earth because of the goodness and the greatness of our God. And then we move from Iconium to Lystra. If you would, we're going to read verses 8 through verse 20. Please read aloud with me. And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw that Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. Oh, folks, we've gone from Iconium to Lystra. Lystra was a city with uneducated men. They had their own language. Evidently, there was no synagogue, not enough Jewish people there for a synagogue. We see that Paul is able to perform a miracle the same as Peter did in Acts chapter 3. We can look back at that today and see validity in the fact that Paul was being used in a, as an apostle similarly to the way that Peter and the other 11 were. Now an interesting story that Luke writes in here for us, this story of Barnabas being related, not, not biologically related, but, but kind of being compared to Zeus and Paul being compared to Hermes. Now, how many of you read in, in high school literature class Greek mythology? Anybody? I had to read that, or I, I was supposed to read that. I think it might be the only time I ever cheated, or I don't know if I'm supposed to admit that I've sinned when I'm preaching. So, might have cheated in my schoolwork was when I was supposed to read this big old thick book about Greek mythology. God, that was awful. But, here I am. I got my high school diploma. So, Zeus was the god of all gods, the chief god. 
But Paul was Hermes, the messenger god, if you will. I think that, now that's Greek mythology. If you change it over to the Roman gods and Roman mythology, then the chief god would be Jupiter, and then the messenger god would be Mercury, I believe. But why was this priest all of a sudden involved? Well, the old fable is, is that years before this, that, that Zeus and Hermes had actually come to this city of Lystra. And when they got there, everybody ignored them and turned away from them, except for this little poor couple living on the outskirts of town. And that little poor couple received them and worshipped them and took care of them. And so Zeus and Hermes gave them this big mansion to live in and all the authority over the city and all those type things. And so the priest of Zeus, right outside the city, he didn't want to make the same mistake twice. And so he was going overboard to make sure we're not going to miss our second chance of all of this great, all of these great mansions and all of these blessings that Zeus and Hermes can give us. Great resistance of pride. Paul and Barnabas, don't do that. Don't do that. We are men just like you. And it's a very simple sermon. I would surmise it this way. Paul said, God is right. You are wrong. Turn to God. At the end of the day, folks, it is so hard for us to tell people that. I know I live in the same world that you do. It is so hard, but it is the truth. And we have to start standing up just firmer than what we currently do. And with love and compassion and reaching out to help people, just be willing to tell them, I'm sorry, not really sorry, but I'm sorry to hurt your feelings, but God is right, you are wrong. We all must turn to God, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But people don't want to hear it. You might not get stoned in 2023 America, but people don't want to hear that. And Paul is stoned. He's drug outside the city, and the people think he's dead. The Bible says supposing. Nine times out of ten in the New Testament when the word suppose or supposing, it, it, it means that people thought something was true, but it really wasn't. Paul wasn't really dead, but the people thought that he was. And so now let's read these last verses together, verse 21 through 28 as we finish the first missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas. Please read aloud with me. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. Now when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Those of you that are reading, kudos to you, because the names of those towns are difficult. Verse 27, Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them, and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So what gives as we finish the journey? Many disciples in the city of Der Derby. Paul was from, if you wonder, why didn't Paul just keep going east? Well, he was from Cilicia, and that's where Tarsus is. And so he had probably already preached all through that region and that province. This whole missionary journey of Paul and Barnabas took about a year. I would tell you that it was probably about 48 A.D., 47 or 48 A.D. So we're talking maybe 15 years after the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. But we see something very important. God was saving Gentiles without any Jewish steps being necessary. You, didn't know, you, you did not have to go back and follow the Mosaic law in order to have your sin forgiven and be right with God. Now, from the text this morning, I want to point out these three things. I challenge you, folks. We've seen it from Paul and Barnabas. God's given us his word so that we have, in this case, an example of how he wants us to be. Remain strong in the faith. The Bible ne never tells us to pull out a sword and cut people's ear off or cut their head off or to stab them or anything like that. But the Bible repeatedly tells us, stand firm in our faith, ladies and gentlemen, no matter how hard and difficult it is. But a warning for you, it's not going to be easy to remain in the faith. And then the other thing is they went, they laid hands, they chose elders. Organization in the church matters. The Bible doesn't ever give us just this clear depiction of exactly how a church government should be, but the Bible definitely tells us that we are to be organized and we are to be above board in everything we do. So transformation of life. How does this passage today, Acts chapter 14, impact you as you leave this place? One, I want to remind you, God gives the mission. 
Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, they were going on a mission, and God, the Holy Spirit, laid it on their heart and made it obvious to everybody that they are supposed to go and they are supposed to spread the gospel to new parts of the earth. God gives the mission. And then I want you to know that we see that the church is supposed to attest and support the mission. I have an opportunity this morning to tell you about Cody Johnson, one of our missionaries. We support him. He came. He served in our church. He helped with the youth. He's 21 years old. He was doing all kinds of things to help with vacation Bible school. And he came forward and he said, I am being called to go into missions. And we as a church were able, without some like kind of weird vote or anything like that, we were able to attest, yes, you are being called. We're with you. And we're not just going to pray for you and say, hey, good luck, oh boy. I hope you win some folks to Jesus. No, we put our money where our mouth, our money where our mouth is, and we support him every single month, making sure that Cody has what he needs so he can focus on telling people about Jesus and not worry about where his next meal is. Part of our endeavors with the International Mission Board, with the North American Mission Board, is that we are putting people into action, that disciples are not only being made, that not only are we out there reaching as a group of churches, but we are also out there and we are teaching the people who don't, do come to faith in Christ so that they can become mature believers and be exactly who God wants them to be. And ladies and gentlemen, in the local church, we must do the same thing. But this is tough. We've been blessed here over the last few years. We've had new disciples. We've had people be baptized. But we can never forget that God brings the harvest. Jesus paints this picture in which he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. It's almost like saying, now, now I, I never want to doubt or put into question the sovereignty of God, but it is almost like God is saying in that passage, in some way, a lot more folks would be getting saved if y'all would get up off your rear end and go tell somebody about me. Ladies and gentlemen, your neighbor, your friend, so your friend, your relative, your associate, your neighbor, do they even know that you're a Christian? If they know you leave on Sunday morning and come to church, do they even know what that means? Or do they just know that you're the church type? Do they just know that when they get injured or one of their parents or one of their children's in trouble, they can come over to your house and ask you to say a prayer? Or do they really know what it means to be a Christian? But we've got to trust that no matter what we do, God brings the harvest. And this is hard because Brother Ron was here first service. Paul was stoned and left for dead. I can't promise you how your life will end. But I can promise you that if God puts you on mission, the church attests the mission, attests to the mission and supports you, and you get out there and you're serving Jesus, that there will be a harvest. And I can almost pro also promise you this, that no matter what, no matter how bad or tough it is on you, that he is going to, because of his grace, enable you to finish what he has called you to do. You hear me on that? From our worldly, earthly standards, we think people die too young. But we look at that incorrectly. The way that we should look at it, at it as, look at it is this. I'm going to run for Jesus. And I trust that when I finish my work, I'll get to meet him face to face. And if we can ever become strong enough Christians that meeting him face to face is more important than just laying around on the couch doing nothing, then you know you're becoming a mature disciple. Hey. 
shake his face, shine upon you. 